God wants to bring a jubilee to America, a year of release. And I believe he wants to disannul and break a covenant of death that we had. And you know, the nature of breakthrough oftentimes leads to other breakthroughs. That's why many times a breakthrough could be so difficult is because of the influence of a breakthrough. Breakthroughs in our own lives, which I want to address in a few moments, but the nature of a breakthrough is not just the blessing of the breakthrough, which we'll address, but it is the influence it has leading to other breakthroughs. 1947, I'll share the 1947, it was October. I read this some time ago. At that point in time, uh, the top speed for pilots to pilot an airplane was under the speed of sound, which is about 757 miles an hour. Now, there were other pilots, Air Force pilots and Naval pilots, you know, that had the spirit of adventure, and they wanted to challenge that. I think at the time they were pressing near 600 miles an hour, and that was really moving. I'm talking in the 40s. And so there were those, you know, that wanted to press it, but they had bad experiences. There were some that crashed. Because certain things happen, evidently, when you approach the speed of sound and when you're going into uncharted territories, they, uh, an uncharted territory, they were not fully prepared for the uncharted territory. So something happened within them when they would begin to black out, they would begin to get dizzy. They would hit a turbulence at such a degree, such as like they had never experienced, that they weren't trained to man the craft at that degree of turbulence. So many pilots who had dreams of going beyond that limitation, when they hit the tribulation, when they hit the turbulence, they pulled back. And then they basically consigned themselves to a limitation of speed that was acceptable. But there was a man by the name of Chuck Yeager. And Chuck Yeager had that spirit as a pilot. He was a brigadier general. And he was a U.S. Air Force pilot. And it came into his heart to want to go beyond what was, for pilots, the acceptable place of speed. And so he did his due diligence, he did his research, he gathered testimonies, he spoke to others that he knew that would maybe even challenge. And most of the feedback, as I read, was all negative. You've got to be careful, you could crash. Have you ever tried to believe God for something and five people tell you how it didn't work for them? You believe in God for healing and suddenly three people feel led to tell you how four people died that they prayed for? Don't be, don't be surprised because, let me tell you, it's not that they're the enemy, but the enemy wants for you to live in confinement. He doesn't want you to press beyond because he knows that if that happens, the influence it will have for others. So he's always trying to keep us in a narrow place, even in our experience with God. In light of what Pastor Lou said, you know, okay, I can't stop you from getting in the river, but stay in the ankles, right? Stay ankle deep. And meanwhile, the Spirit of God says, go deeper, go deeper. And so Chuck Yeager wanted to go deeper as far as his experience. Well, there came the day in October 1947. He was determined, I'm going to do it. I don't know fully what I'm going to experience. I've got the testimonies and I've got the discouragement. I have never experienced. So he went with a determination. And as his speedometer began to climb, climb 500, 600 miles an hour, and he started to kiss the speed of sound. Suddenly that craft began to shake. It felt like every bolt is going to come loose. It was like the challenge for flight that he ever faced was upon him, and he had a critical decision to make. Do I, in the face of tribulation, do I, in the face of turbulence, do I pull back and just have to console myself with, well, I've tried, but my experience will be 
to live and accept the confines of speed of flight. But something in Chuck said, don't do it. And he made a crucial decision. He pressed. When he pressed, suddenly he pressed through the tribulation and he came into a kind of flight he had never experienced. He pressed beyond it and he released, not even knowing this, a sonic boom. An explosion occurred. Never since the dawn of creation had there been that sound release. By him pressing forward and breaking through, he released a sound that was never released in the earth. And let me tell you what that sound was. That sound, to me, if I was there, was an explosion. To pilots, that sound was an invitation. It could be done. Out of his life, the sound of his breakthrough invited others into the breakthrough. It says you could do it. He landed his plane. And now guess what? They're flying at Mach 3. That was Mach 1. That's what they call it. Mach 3 speeds. They're flying 1,500, 2,000 miles an hour with specially designed crafts. All because one man got a breakthrough. It literally catapulted a whole experience of flight into new dimensions. Because one man said, I'm going to press beyond the challenges, the shaking, the trials, the tribulation. And I believe in the realm of the Spirit, there's a message there for us. Because I guarantee you, just like the children of Israel, what was between their wilderness and a land of honey and a land of fruit and a promised land, they had a breakthrough giants. There was a barrier of giants that threatened their well-being. And without anybody getting speared, without anybody receiving a punch, without anybody getting killed by a giant, they came back under the confines of a wilderness. Why? The giant got in their head. That's all the giant needed to do. Once the giants were able to get into their heads and change their identity of how they saw themselves, not in light of the breakthrough, in light of the challenge to the breakthrough. They redefined themselves in light of what they were facing, and it just basically, they pulled back like those other pilots, and they said, we'll just learn to live in a wilderness. God had to raise up another generation. Listen, I believe that the Spirit of God is putting within our hearts to not settle for anything less than all that is afforded us in Christ. I believe, and you're a well-taught church, and I know your pastor, and especially concerning the things of the kingdom of God, and so we learn about the kingdom and the good news of the kingdom and the principles of the kingdom and, and the power of the kingdom and all these things God wants us aware of. We can know all those things and lack the spirit of the kingdom. And the spirit of the kingdom is depicted in various parables, but there's one in particular. And it's the parable of a woman. A woman that had ten pieces of silver. Ten speaks of completeness. How many know there are ten commandments? That's the law of God. All the other laws find themselves rooted in the ten. Nine commandments is not a complete law. It's ten. Ten is the number of completion. Silver speaks of redemption. The silver. So what it represents, and I believe the woman represents the church. And so what we have is a woman that was given and she possessed the fullness of redemption. But something happened in her experience where she lost a dimension of the benefits of redemption. She had nine. How many would say nine out of ten is pretty good? How many wish you went through high school and got a 90 on every test? Oh yeah, it's cause for celebration. I love baseball. If I could hit the ball nine times out of ten, I'd be playing for the New York Yankees. Are you kidding me? Nine out of ten, whether it's darts, test, or baseball, is good. 
It puts you in superstar status, nine out of 10. But this woman possessed the spirit and says, I don't want nine out of 10. I want everything Jesus died for me to have. The Bible said she swept the house. Man, she started looking under the bed. Where is that lost coin? Where is that one? It's incomplete without the one. Maybe it was the coin of healing. Maybe it was the coin of deliverance. Maybe she had the coin of salvation, but didn't have the coin of deliverance. Maybe she had the coin of the assurance of forgiveness, but didn't have the coin of healing. There are entire denominations that's missing a few coins. Oh, they love Jesus and they're saved, but they say he doesn't heal anymore. You know what I want to say to that group? Go find your coin. There's entire groups that say, yeah, we're saved and water baptized, but we don't believe in this baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know what I want to tell them? You lost a coin. I want everything. I want everything he died for me to be. I want everything the Holy Spirit has promised that he would bring. I don't want to live with 9 out of 10. I don't want a 90 in Christianity. I want 100. God said, yeah, if you want 100, then don't be content with 9 out of 10. And I believe spiritual hunger is the key characteristic for God to be invited to do with a life you could never dream he could do. It's not crossing all your T's perfect. I believe in right doctrine. It's not dotting all your I's. But I'm a student enough of revival to know God will hop over the doctrinally correct and he'll visit the hungry heart. Come on now. You see, you think your mess is the reason why God can. I'm telling you it's the reason why he wants to. Because God delights, he delights in turning your mess into the miracle so that he gets all the glory. He delights. That doesn't give us license to not be a good steward, but it prevents us from settling because all of our life is not in the order we think it's supposed to be, and if it's not, somehow God will pass us by. I've got a Bible that says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was in chaos. Everything was out of order. That's how my Bible starts. God didn't scrap it. God said, you know what I'm going to do with the chaos? I'm going to put the Holy Ghost on it. And I'm going to direct a move of the Spirit on the mess and the chaos. And then I'm going to speak into it. And when I speak into that chaos, I'm going to give you sunrises you couldn't dream of. I'll give you trees that you can't believe the beauty. I'll give you a mountain that will take your breath away. I will bring such beauty out of your mess. I will bring such glory glory out of your death. I will bring what only I can bring. How many got a mess today? I'm here to tell you, you are the place where God wants to move. God said, I'll take a life. What man says, there's nothing that could come out of that. When God wants to bring forth the Son of God and manifest himself in flesh, he's not going to bring Jesus out of some beautiful seaside village. He's going to come out of Nazareth where they say no good thing can come out of Nazareth. I'm going to bring him out of the ghetto. I'm going to bring him out of the South Bronx. I'm going to bring him out of where man said nothing good can come out because that's what God does. I'll bring a revival out of Salem. I'll turn the witch city into to a Holy Ghost city. I'll turn this place as a place known where deliverance runs. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. You believe it? Yes. Give him praise if you believe that. I believe that. I believe that. I want to talk to you about the power of an inner shift. Where's my whatever? There it is. Okay. The power of an inner shift. The power of your breakthrough. This morning, the Spirit of God spoke about the rivers. Get in the river. Pastor Lou began to further exhort us how that that river in the Bible is seen from coming out of the threshold of the house of God. One of the things we need to understand is that all true revival 
is more of an outpouring than a downpouring. He already downpoured 2,000 years ago. And so in an upper room. And more, Jesus said these words, out of your belly, out of your innermost being. Now listen to what he says. Shall continue unceasingly will flow. Rivers of living water. This he spake of the Holy Spirit which would afterward be given, but Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was prophesying of an experience and a possibility of what was to come after the cross, after the resurrection, after the ascension. I'm going to open up opportunity for you that they didn't have in the Old Testament, that man never knew. And that is that out of you is going to flow supernatural life. And God says, I want your life to become a portal where from you what will issue forth is rivers of living water bringing life. And Ezekiel gives us the picture as Pastor Lou, everything that the river touched, lived and the fish which always speaks of the harvest and the fish were living in the river and so God wants us to capture a fresh vision that Phil Capuccio has been called of God to be a portal that out of my life life could flow out of my life rivers of living water whether I'm behind a pulpit or whether I'm sipping on a cold brew next to somebody, that there could be something that could pour out of my life that can make a difference. And he wants us aware of this. He wants us expectant of this. And let me tell you, in this day, come on, somebody say it's a body thing. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit everyone. Wow. I like the word manifest. Because you know what manifest means? To make oneself conspicuously known. To make oneself conspicuously known. Now God says, my plan involves... I want everybody to understand that my desire is that through your life I can make myself conspicuously known in your generation. Not just through the lives of a few highly anointed ones. Not just apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. Someone say, that's me. Yeah, you're included in the every man. Every woman, every man, every person. That means God wants to uniquely make himself conspicuously known. And let me tell you what the devil wants to do. He wants to keep you back like all those other pilots living in a confined place so that can't happen. So that can't happen. I tell this story recently. How that when I lived in the Bronx and right before we were going to move to Long Island, which was June of 1972, I had a very best friend who lived a few doors from where I lived in the Bronx. His name was Johnny. We played baseball together. My best friend. So knowing I was going to move, we had this project we got involved with. I was at the time 11 years old. And together we set up a 10-gallon tank in John's room because he wanted a fish tank. My cousin had, had done that. And so John and I, were gonna, so we go down to the pet store on the avenue there. We get some fish. He purchases a tank. And we're going to build this fish tank. Had a lot of fun doing it. And we did that. So I wanted to do that as like the first order of business in my brand new room in our new house by the ocean on Long Island. Mom, can I have a fish tank? Sure, you can have a fish tank. That's one of the first things I did in the summer when we moved to Long Island. So I get a 10-gallon tank. Have anybody ever, I don't even know if that people do that anymore, but that was big. And so 10-gallon tank, 
And I say, and I couldn't, and you got to get the cobalt blue gravel. I mean, you got to have cobalt blue. Looks like glass. Bottom, it's magnificent. And then I put a little shipwreck in there, and I put fake coral, and I say, man, I felt like God. I created this world for my little guppies and my angel fish, and you got to have goldfish. And I'll tell you what I used to do. So I did, I created this world, this aquatic world. I'd shut off all the lights in my room. I'd sit on my bed, and I'd put the fish tank light on, and I'd watch. And I'd see those fishes glow. And when those goldfish came out of the shipwreck, they were like luminance. I mean, like effervescent. It was like, wow. Years later, I'm at a restaurant, seafood restaurant, up in Maine. And the centerpiece in the lobby is a 100-gallon tank. And man, I'm like, whoa. We're waiting for our table. And I go over to that tank. I never saw a tank that big. And they had all kinds of exotic fish. And there was another guy looking at the fish. And he's telling me the names in Latin. This guy knew. Oh, he's talking about this fish, where it comes from, and all about the filtration system. And I'm looking at this tank. And I said, you want to know something? I had a 10-gallon tank one time. And suddenly it brought back memories of my 10-gallon tank. So I, and all of a sudden, this goldfish comes out. It's about that big. I said, I don't know what kind they are. I had these goldfish. I go like that. And you know what he said? They were the same ones. I said, no, no. Mine were this big. Yeah, he said, well, that's because you had them in a 10-gallon tank. What? Yeah, you, you constricted the oxygen intake. If you would take your goldfish, he said, and put them in this tank, they'd grow to this big. I said, there's no, you knew that? I didn't know that. Man, I felt bad at first. I thought, I kept midget goldfish. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but God, God began to talk to me as I thought about that. He said, son, you know what the prophetic word is all about? Smashing the tank of thoughts my people live in. He said, because I got little goldfish Christians that live in little tanks of thoughts that have been constructed, and the word of the Lord comes to smash tanks. The word of the Lord comes to smash ten. God doesn't want, in this hour, 10-gallon tank Christians. He wants the word to come and smash that tank and cause you to think with possibilities of what God can do so that you don't live within the confines of your nice little Christian life just a hoping and a praying. God said, oh no, I got something greater in store for your life and I want you to respond with that kind of faith because I got a plan for you and I've got a plan of what I want to do through you and God said, I'm going to bring my word to smash that tank you've been living in because I want you to grow and I want your prayers to not be 10 gallon prayers. I don't want you to have 10 gallon faith. I want you to stand and agree that you know you're talking to a God of limitless possibility of what he could do, what he's given in his word. Hallelujah! I don't want to be 10 gallons. And you know it's so easy because everything in our life experience, everything we hear in the news, everything we see we walk in the streets wants to keep us in a 10-gallon just survival kind of mode. But God said, no, don't let these confines uh, become the landmarks of your thoughts. He said, I want you to think outside the box. I want you to believe outside the box. I'm telling you, I'm expanding your horizon." Hallelujah. I feel the spirit of a breakthrough here this morning. I'm telling you right now. But let me talk to you about breakthrough. And the reason why is because God identifies himself as the God of breakthrough in the scripture. That's what he calls himself. The God of breakthrough. The Bible says in Micah, let's, let's me, let me read some of the Bible so you know I'm preaching to you. Micah chapter 2 and verse 13. The breaker. Someone say, the breaker. The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up. They have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. 
and their king shall pass before them, and the Lord will be, it says on the head, the Lord will be ahead of them. Now, this, this situation is about progress for the people of God through Micah. And here's what it says. The people of God can make progress because not just the healer, not just Jehovah Nissi, not just Jehovah Shammah, because the breaker, the breaker comes upon them. And because God is a breaker, it's altogether possible for you to progress. Because with every progress, there are challenges. With every progress, there are obstacles. But we got the breaker. We got the breaker. In fact, one of the earliest references to the anointing. How many know the anointing? If we got the Holy Ghost, that's the anointing. The anointing isn't just a feeling. The anointing is God. And the Bible said the anointing that abides within you. Someone say, the anointing is in me. Well, one of the earliest references to the anointing is, and the anointing will break the yoke in Isaiah. The very characteristic of what you're carrying is a breakthrough anointing. That's why you never have to settle for 10-gallon living. Why? I'm carrying the anointing and one of its virtues, its breakthrough. That's why I never have to say I'll only go so far. He told the children of Israel, he told Joshua, he told Abraham, wherever you put the sole of your feet, I'll give it to you. If you walk 10 gallons, you got it. If you want to go 20 gallons, you got it. The limitation is not with me. It's the possibility of what you could walk out. Wow. The anointing is in you. You are carrying the keys to your own breakthrough by virtue of who lives inside of you. You don't need something from without. It's the release out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, I began to investigate this idea of breakthrough. David called God breakthrough when he broke forth upon the Philistines. He built an altar and he called the name of it Bel Perizim, 2 Samuel 5, which means the God of breakthroughs. Wow. So I began to investigate breakthrough. And it comes from a Hebrew word, parats, I don't, P-A-R-A-T-S. And I don't know if it's parrots or parats, but here's the idea of a breakthrough. Man, I, I tell you, I had a shout. A breakthrough in the full idea of what it means doesn't just mean God intervening. How many people have ever asked for prayer because you need a breakthrough? We all have at one time. I need a breakthrough in my finances. I need a breakthrough in my marriage. I need a breakthrough on my job. I need a break. We need a breakthrough. And usually the idea is this. I need God to intervene. Right? I, I need a breakthrough. I need God to do something in my finances. I need God to do something in my body. I need God to do something in whatever area you feel like you are insufficient. I need God to basically enter in and fix it, and that's our idea of a breakthrough. Do you know that's not biblically what breakthrough means? Breakthrough carries three dimensions for a full breakthrough. Here's what it means. To break in, something has broken in. As a result of something that broke in, the next dimension is something broke down. As a, dimension, as a result of a breakdown, something broke out. So a real breakthrough is God breaking in so at the end I could break out? A breakthrough is not complete until I break out. The whole idea of a breakthrough is not God entering in and fixing the problem. The idea is God comes in. Because he came in, whether he comes in through his word, comes in by the Spirit. However God finds entrance, by virtue of God coming in, things that have been holding you back break down. As a result of what got broken down, a 10-gallon tank got broken, the last part is I break out. I break out into new territory. I break out into a new experience. I break out into a new expectation. And the breakthrough is complete when you break out. How many now want a breakthrough? 
See, God says, no, I'm not coming to fix everything. Oh, I'll initiate and I'll arrive on the scene, but the end result will be you're going to break out. You're going to break out into a new dimension. You're going to break out into new yieldedness. You're going to break out into new surrender so I could do new things through your life. So basically, God says the breakthrough involves me and you. Hallelujah. So many times we just want God to fix everything. God said, no. God said, no, I'm involved, but you're going to co-labor together with me. And it's the end result is what happens to you. So a real breakthrough is when you're breaking out. I remember it was about 11 years ago. There was a tremendous, we all saw it, a tremendous tsunami from like uh, Indonesia, uh, from the west, and it hit Japan. As a result of it hitting Japan, remember they had the Fukushima meltdown and they were wearing masks a lot longer than we were because of the, the meltdown. Even to this day, there's, there are the remains of radioactive material that started in Japan that has washed up on the shores of California. Amazing. But what we all saw was a tsunami. A tsunami hit Japan, and do you know, and you can look this up, not now, if I hear you talking to Siri right now, I'm telling you right now, don't you ask Siri a single question right now, but you could talk to Siri later, I looked this up, do you know Japan moved eight feet? It was a measurable move, an entire nation, the island of Japan, moved as a result of the tsunami. Now, that's something we all observed. Where did the tsunami come from? The tsunami came from an earthquake, and that's measurable. It was like 10 on the Richter scale, an incredible earthquake. Okay, got another question. Where did the earthquake come from? Ah, the earthquake came from something no human eye could see. 15 miles in the dark, below the surface, a shift occurred. A shift of tectonic plates occurred, which gave birth to an earthquake, which gave birth to a tsunami. In other words, the outward manifestation that changed the landscape of a nation stemmed from an inner shift where no man could see. The greatest advancements in our life come from inner shifts. Everything in the kingdom is from the inside out. Out. If there could just come an inner shift today, if the power of the Word of God could shift something, the Word is sharper and more powerful than any two-edged sword. And the Bible says that it goes deep into us and it separates soul from spirit. In fact, it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If the Word of God can find entrance into the depths of my heart and shift some things, what could pour out of me is a tsunami of blessing, rivers of living water, a tsunami of life, a tsunami of manifestations of God could come out of Phil Capuccio if he could only shift some things on the inside. Hallelujah. Someone say, Lord, bring a shift. Bring a shift. Abraham is the father of all who believe. Abraham is basically the beginning man of all redemptive purposes, Abraham. The New Testament begins with this verse, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Abraham is the first man mentioned when you're going to learn about Jesus, you've got to understand he's the seed of Abraham. Abraham is the man of great promise, but who is this Abraham? 
He's a man that needed a shift. When you really look at the life of Abraham, Paul writes a whole lot about him in the book of Romans. And then Paul says these words. Abraham, who is our father, the fa in Romans 4, who, he said, you are called to walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. If Abraham is my father, according to Galatians, then I better be able to identify some of the steps he walked in in faith. This man that God called his friend, this man that God was able to bring forth out of his life, redemption, the seed of Messiah, and everything else that has changed my life, I am called in my new birth as a child of Abraham. I better be able to identify some of those steps so I too could walk in the promises of Abraham. Are you following me? If I go to the very first step he took, I want you to go with me to he, uh, Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Let's learn something about the man that had a shift. If you go down to verse 27 of Genesis 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram. Now follow this. This is his father. This is Abram's father. Nahor, Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So Lot is Abram's nephew. Verse 28. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity. And where were they living? In Ur of the Chaldees, which is Babylon, where they were building the Tower of Babylon. They were living in that land, and Terah experienced the most tragic thing a parent could experience, the death of a child. That's against nature. A parent does not expect to be predeceased by their children. There is no sorrow that could be more deep and more of a burden to the heart than to have to visit the graveside of your child. And Haran died. That's interesting. Verse 29. Abram and Nahor took them wives, the Nahor's wife, Micah, uh, Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, Lot the son of Haran, the one that died, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and lived there. After he buried his son, the disappointment, the pain of the loss, he basically called a family meeting and said, I can't live here any longer. I can't live in this place of sorrow. Well, what are we going to do, Dad? We're getting out of here. I got to move on. All right, everybody, get your livestock. Sarai, we got to go. We're going to go with Dad. He calls the whole family. I really believe he wanted to escape from a place of disappointment and a place of sorrow. Where are we going, Dad? Canaan. Canaan, oh yeah, it's a fruitful place. It's a beautiful place. Later on, Canaan becomes the land of promise. It's the land of milk and honey. It came into the Father's heart to want to get to a fruitful place and not live in a place of sorrow. So he said, that's where we're going. We're going to go to Canaan. That's where I want to go. Okay. So they start going, and they're probably dreaming about the fruit, thinking about this new place. But they get about halfway, 
and they come to a place that has the same name as his son. Now, what scholars don't, it's the first time that place is mentioned. Here's the question. Did it have that name or did he name it? We don't know. But what we do know is this. Somewhere along the journey, even though he left the event, even though he's far from the funeral, he's no longer at the cemetery. He's got every intention to get to a fruitful land. Somewhere in the journey, the sorrow went with him. The disappointment traveled with him. And I don't know if there was an experience. Somewhere he's got every intention to get to Canaan. He's got every desire to get to a fruitful place. But somewhere his journey was sabotaged because though he left the cemetery, the sorrow went with him. And he dwelt in a land that was named after the son he lost. He said, we're going to stay here. Abram stayed there. Sarai stayed there. And here's the interesting thing. Do you know that there are confines we could pass on generationally? There are limitations we could pass on that could affect the, the forward progress of generations. Everybody ended up living in dad's sorrow. And so they're trying to make the best of it. And so they're living there. Meanwhile, God had another plan. Abram doesn't know God. He just went as far as dad could take them. And that was going to be the limitation. But one day, I don't know how long they were there. Tara died there. He died in his sorrow. He died in his disappointment. He never tasted the pomegranate. He never tasted the grapes. He never tasted the honey. He never came to Canaan. He, even though he left the event, the spirit of the event never left him. And he died in his sorrow. But we got Abraham there. Abraham has learned to live within the boundary of where dad could take them. So that's where he's living. He's learning how to dwell there. But suddenly a breakthrough was needed. God broke in. And the voice of God came to Abram. Genesis chapter 12. Abram, yes Lord. God's desire was to bring Abram further. But the first thing God said is get up and get out of that land. And separate yourself from your father's house. Abram needed God to break in and change his thinking. Because his thinking was 10 gallons. Dad had set the parameters. But God says, I'm going to bring you to a land. A land your father never brought you to. A land that he couldn't, he didn't have the power to bring you. I'm going to bring you to a land. And it was all about Canaan. Which you will afterward receive as an inheritance. And it was a fruitful land. It was a land Israel would go to. It all speaks of fruitfulness in the kingdom. It speaks of spiritual place. Many times in our journey, we settle for a halfway place. And we just try to make the best of it. I have come by the Spirit of God and say, you got to declare war on a place called halfway. Don't you go halfway. Don't live with nine coins out of the ten. Don't settle. Say, well, I'm a lot farther than where I was. I'm no longer putting the needle in my arm. I'm no longer doing what I used to do. I'm out of Babylon. Yeah, but you ain't in Canaan yet. I'm telling you, there's more. Turn to your neighbor say, there's more. There is a greater thing God wants to do through his people. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And so God broke in. When God broke in, the limitations of where dad established broke down. When that broke down, Abraham broke out. And he began to make new steps going further than where dad stopped. I'm going to tell you something. You may wish until the day Jesus comes back, your family life could have been different. Won't change your past. 
You might have wished you had a better understanding father. You may have wished you had a father to begin with, meaning a man that raised you. You certainly had a man that sired you. You wish you would have had a man that was there for you. You may have wished that you would have lived here. You may have wished mom was this way. You may have wished we didn't have these circumstances. And the devil keeps us occupied in things we could never change in order to keep us in Haran. He doesn't want us to go forward. But I'm here to tell you that's no limit with God. Can you say amen? God is saying you could still get out of Haran. You don't have to live in disappointment. No, no, no. You don't have to live. You're past the event, but the spirit of that event doesn't have to sabotage your future. No, no, no. Don't settle for the halfway place. With the power of God and the word of God, someone say, I'm going to Canaan land. I'm going to be in a fruitful place. Out of my life, there's going to be all manner of fruit. And it's a testimony of what God is able to do. Hallelujah. What was, what was the breakthrough that Abraham needed? He needed to break out of the limitations that was determined and established by the hurt of his father. Without God breaking in, he would have lived there with Sarai. Without God breaking in, that's where he would have died. And it would have become a generational obstacle. But God had plans, and God said, Abraham, you've got to get up, and you've got to leave. And you know what I love? If you look at Genesis chapter 12, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, now the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I'm going to show you. Now watch this. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. You'll be turned into a blessing. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God says, I'm asking you to do one thing. And if you do one thing, it'll release me to do seven things. But I need you to do one. One thing. Many times, it's just one step of obedience that becomes the master key that leads, that opens the door for God to do a succession of things you never thought could be done. And that's why you're fought on that one step of obedience, that one step of faith. God said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. But you will release all of the I wills if you will simply do one thing. Amen. And I love what Abram, it says, so Abram departed. I just need you to get out of the halfway place. And if you will even lean in the right direction, if, you, if you'll take a baby step in the right, if you'll pray, if you will indicate that somehow you believe what I could do more than where you've been living, if you'll just show me that, man, I'll just open up other doors. I'll just do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this in your life. It'll blow you away at what I could do. And so Abram, departed. Wow. God broke in. God broke down. And Abraham broke out. His first step was a breakthrough. And after every step after that, he becomes the friend of God. And every step after that, he's growing in a knowledge of God. He never dreamed he could have, but it all started with leaving a place called halfway. The biggest problem we have in Western Christianity is we settle for a halfway place. We never come into the full potential of kingdom possibility. We never come into the fullness of our callings many times because we settle. I am so thankful you are in a church that provokes. The Bible said we're to provoke one another unto love and good works. You know what that means? In our relationship, we should challenge each other. Take another step. Take another step. Take another step. Take another step. Those relationships in our life are invaluable because we will meet obstacles all along the way, and it will be much easier to say, let's settle here. But we need those relationships that say, come on, take another step. 
Keep going into Canaan. Keep pressing into more fruitfulness. Keep pressing into all that God has for you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's all over the Bible. I'm not going to preach the whole Bible to you today, but it's all over the Bible. When you begin to really see the spirit of it, Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, and I'll spare the reading, but Judges chapter 6, we got a problem. The problem is the Midianites. They are robbing Israel of all their harvest, and God has a plan to deliver them from all their enemies. Now, I would think it'd be real easier just to marshal a few angels, get the ones that have swords, not the messenger ones, get Michael, get all those warring angels, say, go right down to Israel is and decapitate every enemy. Could be done like that. But what intrigues me many times is not what God can do. It's how he does things. It's the way God does things. So God said, I'm going to bless a nation. I'm going to do something that's national in scope. How are you going to do it, God? I'm going to give one man a breakthrough. What? Oh, yeah. One man is going to be a key to the breakthrough of a nation. Who's it going to be? The guy that's hiding. What? The guy that's hiding by that wine press. And here's the angels with their swords ready. No, no, put away your sword. I just need a messenger. I need to get a message to him. Because he's crippled in a dungeon of fear. He's been living a 10-gallon life because his life is identified by everything in the natural I'm going to break in on his life, and he's going to break out, and the nation is going to get a breakthrough. That's what happened. So the messenger, the angel, comes, and here's Gideon. He gets this little harvest, and he's got a survival mentality, and he's hiding behind a wine press, hoping a Midianite will never see him. And he's eating, and I got this little, and he gives some to his wife and to his kids, uh, and, you know, they're just subsisting, and all of a sudden an angel comes on the scene. Hell, you mighty man of valor! And it says, and he thought, what a strange salutation. What are you talking about, mighty man of valor? Are you kidding me? He said, where is God? God has forsaken us. That's what he said. If God was with us, we wouldn't be in this situation. So he wrongly assessed because of his experience that God was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, God just showed up. God broke in. That's why he, he, he established an altar i seen God face to face. God came in the form of an angel with his word. He said, now wait, you're calling me a mighty man? Let me tell you something. You got the wrong guy. And he starts giving all his 10-gallon reasons why he's a little goldfish. He starts giving him every reason why I'm nothing but a little goldfish. He said, because I don't even come from Judah. If I came from Judah, maybe you'd have a point. Maybe if I was a Levite, we could, be, we could believe a few of these things. But man, I'm from Manasseh. Do you realize how small that tribe is? And not only am I from Manasseh, let me give you another reason why I should live in a 10-gallon tank. Because my father, I'm the least of my father's house. How do you like that, Mr. Angel? And you know what the angel says? You're a mighty man. Go in this thy might because he could care less about your tank. I got a word from God and what you need is an inner shift. And you know, after Gideon... He had to fleece the Lord to make sure, is this God? And he goes through all that until finally he accepts what God says. In the face of all of his 10-gallon excuses, am I making sense to you? In the face of all of his 10-gallon excuses, he finally embraces what God said about him. And guess what happened? Something on the inside shifted. And as a result of the shift, Guess what poured out of him? A tsunami of possibility. He starts acting like a general. This was a man hiding. All of a sudden, he starts ordering the people like he's a general. He starts becoming who God said he was all along. And when he begins to agree with God and that inner shift took place, the Bible says, and a great victory was wrought that day from all their enemies. A nation shifted 
because a man in the nation shifted. What could happen in America if there could be a remnant with a shift? What could happen? And God wants to move in our nation. He does. And so he wants to bring a shift. God wants to reach a generation. I've never seen such a concentration of spiritual darkness like I do on the streets of Salem. There's been an increase, Lou. We've been walking around. I see people with more multicolored hair, tattooed up. Uh, you know, and that's, and I, I'm, I'm not, I'm lo- that's a condition that shows the confusion in the soul. It's not about tattoos. Not, it's not about piercings all over the face. It's not about how they can, they are screaming, they don't realize it. They're screaming and they're presenting loud and clear of the turmoil in their soul. That's what I'm concerned about. But you know what the good news is? God's got a people. God's got a people that he planted right where redemption is needed. And if God could get for himself a people that could look upon these fields and get the heart of God for these people, and not just say, man, this is which city? Man, this is bad. Man, I don't... Uh, you'll, you'll live in a 10-gallon tank. Come on. And the darkness will continue to prevail. But if God could get for himself, and he has right here, and there are others, but if God could... We've come to Salem for such a time as this. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And the love of God... If a tsunami could come out of my life, if something could pour out of me that will make a difference, if there could be a shift from a survivor's mentality to somebody that's expecting, say, here I am, Lord, use me. There's no telling what God can do where he can invade a generation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see... Gideon needed a shift of identity. As long as he lived with an identity that was the result of all the natural things that made him in his eyes who he was, he'd live by the wine press and a nation would suffer. But God knew if I could just get a shift. So what does God do? He sends his word. And the word penetrates through all the excuses and declares who he is through God's eyes. Once that man began to believe that, he needed confirmation, but once he latched on to it, it took him out of the cave. It took him away from the wine press, and it got him acting in a way he never dreamt he could act. And as a result, a nation had a tsunami hit it of victory and a tsunami of things they never thought that they could overcome the many because one man had a ship. You have no idea of the tsunami that could hit your family and you're the key. You have no idea of the tsunami of miracles that could come start changing things in your kids, in your family, and you're the key. You're the key. And if he will just shift and suddenly you begin to pray. That's what happened to my mother. My mother would not be content with dad saved, sister saved, and her son not saved. And even though I gave no sign as I'm becoming a teenager, I'm wanting to explore the world more and more and more. Man, I had Saturday night fever so bad, I might as well have the Saturday night flu. And man, I just wanted to go into the world more and more. But mom... Heard God with regards to what God's idea was for Phil Capuccio. And she began to agree. So when I said, Mom, I'm going out with my friends. Mom wouldn't relent in her bedroom to start praying what God had for me. Come on now. 
And I'm here to tell you that I am here because there were some people that believed what God said and agreed with God, and as a result, an encounter changed my life. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. I remember a prophet was sent to a woman 2 Kings chapter 4, 1 through 7, we got a woman and we got a really terrible situation. Her and her sons, her husbands died and her son's about to go to jail, debtor's prison. And man, they're going to be doing some prison time. But God wants to break in. So he sends a prophet. He sends a word. The prophet comes and she goes, man, you don't understand. Debtors are going to come. They're going to take my kids. My husband's gone. So he asks a question. What's in your house? What's in my house? What are you talking about? What's in your house? She goes, there's nothing. There's nothing in my house except this little pot of oil right here. Oh, but she said it was nothing. Because she was viewing anything she had in light of the challenges that were before her. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough strength because what I'm facing, it's a giant. So she needed a shift. So the prophet said, I want you to get what you've been calling nothing. I want you to get that little pot of oil. Your problem is not what little you have. That's not your problem. Your problem is, that's the key to your answer. Your problem is you don't have an opportunity to start literally using what little you have. So go borrow some empty vessels. That's what you need. So she's desperate. She tells her son, all right, go, get, go to the neighbors, knock on the door, say we need a few empty vessels. He starts coming to Mom, I got the garage full of empty vessels. And he said, all right, take what you said is nothing. You said it's nothing, right? Why don't you take your little nothing, start pouring it out. And all of a sudden she goes, all right. You know, when you're desperate, you do things that you never dreamed you'd do. So she took that little oil that was staring her in the face every day until a shift would have come. So she took that little nothing, and she begins to pour it out. And she looks, pour out again, and she starts filling all these vessels, and she begins to see an outcome, a miraculous outcome, using what little she had. Why? Because she needed a shift. That little thing was a key to the miraculous, but she needed to see it with different eyes. You say, oh, if I only had this gift, if I only had that gift, if I only had... How many here have a little pot of oil on the inside of them? Do you have a little anointing? Do you have a little touch of God in your life? The key is not you having what I have. The key, stop measuring what you have by what you think others have. Start using that little oil. Start, you got a little story to tell? Tell the story. You got a little witness to give? Start giving the witness. And you're going to find something out in the kingdom of God. What will begin to pour out of you will be a tsunami. Suddenly it grows. Suddenly it increases. Suddenly God begins to do things in your life you never dreamed he could do. And all the while you think you needed something more for God to do. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. She needed a shift with regards to what she possessed. So many times we don't think we have what it takes and we're always looking to want more, thinking we need more in order to put us in another place. God says, use what you have and watch what I will do. Do you realize as I look at you, there's already way too many people God needs to do incredibly and powerful things here. If God had one man, both the Bible and history teaches, he sought for a man, just man, that would stand in the gap. That's all I do. If I could have one chord of agreement in the earth, if I could have one man that will hear my voice, if I could have somebody that will say, I believe you, God, I could change a world. 
God has himself a people. Shift. 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 Stand with me to your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too this. You're not too that. Lift your hands to the Lord, would you? Hallelujah. Pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Pray it like you believe it. Lord Jesus, for such a time as this, I open up my heart to the word of the Lord. Let there come shifts and let there come changes that only your word can bring. But not only in my life, but in the lives of those I'm joined to. And I stand in this sanctuary joined with brother and sister. And together we surrender ourselves so that you might shift, you might change, you break in, you break down, and together we break out in all that you've called for our lives. In the name of Jesus, Hallelujah! 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 You know, one of the great aspects of the God we worship is He loves to take ordinary things and do extraordinary things in, with, and through those lives. That's what He does best. So if you are nothing more than ordinary, you're the candidate for some glorious things that God wants to do. Can you say amen? amen. God bless every one of you. We love you.